Umber, a naturally occurring pigment, a moderate yellowish brown, has been around since the Neolithic period, Neolithic meaning the New Stone Age, so a very long time, which is why it baffles me why the land-based relative of the green-skinned Vodianoi is called an umber hulk, when they are quite dark actually, much darker than most official artwork for the monster depicts them, and they are either a little more brown or yellow on the belly side of their body. So given the name, a lot of artists over the decades have been painting the monsters wrong, and it's not entirely their fault, they were expecting a creature called the umber hulk to actually be the colour umber. It's not. But that's just the first weird quirk about these creatures, so settle back, grab yourself a tasty beverage. We are about to get deeply nerdy. Like most residents of Toril, my first experience with these creatures was not the whole monster, it was just a single part of it, the mandible. Not the most commonly available monster body part, but the thing is, when an object is really strong and used for relatively normal things, it tends to last a very long time. And as the Galeb Dua phrase goes, sit in one place for long enough and the whole world passes you by. Well, eventually. Everyone comes across an Umber Hulk or Vodianoi jaw blade being used by some old farmer for weeding his field or some such. It's as handy as a hand scythe, wickedly sharp, and has a good weight to it, and it basically never wears out. Stat-wise, it's just a dagger with a curve and a serrated edge made out of an organic material. Not metal, so lots of uses. Very popular with druids and the like but quite hard to come by and not even the body part which is considered valuable on the monster. That would be the small set of eyes, those very creepy, very humanoid looking eyes. But let's take a look at the whole creature, not just bit by bit, shall we? Probably the best source of information on the life and biology of the Umber Hulk are the species called the Neogi, as they commonly breed, train and keep hulks aboard their spelljammer vessels. So part security, part labour and part vehicle, the Umber Hulks are treated pretty much how we would treat an automaton, a robot or an android. The Neogi are a pretty vicious and horrible species though, and I avoid them like the plague. But I did manage to get my hands on some information written by an ex-slave of the Neogi where the care and breeding of umber hulks was briefly mentioned. First off, this is not a mindless animal. Umber hulks have a capacity for intelligent thought that very rarely gets mentioned by seasoned adventurers, because probably they either murder or get murdered by the hulks and never get a chance to find out. Umber hulks are meat eaters and they are fairly bloodthirsty predators who see humans in particular as nothing more than prey, and it's hard to communicate with a creature that just wants to eat you. They do know the difference between humanoid species, but it's like the difference between chicken and duck and turkey to them, all of which are quite delicious. Humans, of course, are the chickens. My first experience with the marine umber hulks known as the Vod Yanoi was in an unexpected adventure with a fisherman on the docks of Halligard on a particularly nasty, hot, humid and insect-plagued afternoon. Thanks to the River Gallagher and the swamp teeming all around its massive estuary system on the shore of the inland sea named Lake Halrua, that swamp, I am told, is like the shadow of a baby compared to the enormous and infamous jungles to be found just over the mountains. It's the seeds and such that wash down that river that has spawned this swamp, which is why the place is so much different to other forests and such in Halrua. And with those plants and seeds and things, they have unique fish species up that river that can be found nowhere else. Well, nowhere safe. But safe is a relative term in the Forgotten Realms. And this particular incident, whenever I fully relate it to people from other planets, seems to shock them. But let me just say, but let me just say, this is normal for Toril. It's a very dangerous place, and a lot darker than you may think. Oh, some of you have mentioned it. Why are there so many monsters? How can anyone just lead an ordinary life there? Well, there are tigers and lions, and you seem just fine going on picnics. So you get used to your own level of safety, I guess. It's not very often on Earth that you have to deal with the sight of humans being actively eaten like livestock, though. And this was one of those adventures. With some time to wait for my transport out of Halrua, and hearing much of the unique jungle and the people who fish for golden snapper and lizardfish and all those other species found there, including an intelligent tree octopus that is as scary and horrible as it sounds, I jumped at the chance to hop aboard a sturdy fishing boat, grab a long pole of giant grass, and heave our way up the current and into the swamp. The first fishing village we came to was just a wash of blood screams, sorely pressed healers, and a great number of folk who had fled the inner swamp, which is what I would call the all the side tributary streams which branch off 
from the main flow of the Gallagher River. There was another town called Bora, which got wiped out thanks to such an influx of victims just after the spell plague, eaten out of food, everything that could be uprooted and taken by those desperate to just journey on survive was taken and the original townsfolk left along with them. I won't go into the details, some of which I find extraordinary and want to double check, but the reason why there were so many victims was that along with transporting the entire nation to another world, that also cut off a large population of essentially hunter-gatherer Vodianoi from their main hunting grounds in the swamps of the Lapal Sea leaving them no choice but to turn to humans as their main food source. The reason there were plenty of clerics in the area is because the Swamp of Aklaur, as the locals call it, is also rife with wandering undead. I know what you may be thinking, surely this is not the peaceful and advanced Halrua with its wizards and airships art and arcane wonders. Yes, it most certainly is. So there were serious complications due to the magic which saved an entire nation from flooding and such, which are still being played out over a hundred years later. If that sounds like I'm painting the Vodianoi as some sort of victim in this, like their predation on the humans was something they otherwise would have avoided, that's not the case. They have been raiding and killing and eating people all along the river for centuries. Only they've never been trapped in that one body of water before and they do have formidable appetites. The most common injury among the survivors was fevers caused by inhaling swamp water. There was also a lot of cases of people surviving having one or more limbs torn from their body and of course those mute wretches who had witnessed their children being butchered in front of them and whose minds could now see nothing else. Clerics can deal with many wounds but a mind ripped apart is seldom mended by magic. So I will spare you the worst of it. I'm not here to traumatize you, just share some tales and information that may help you one day, and remind you that in the Forgotten Realms, people get eaten every day. They don't just get eaten in far off places, out of sight and out of mind. They get eaten on safe trade roads. They get eaten while washing clothing on a rock in a creek. This is just part of day-to-day life. By contrast, if I told the average Torellian how many humans get killed by cars every day on Earth, they'd be absolutely horrified, and yet telling them there are billions of humans on Earth would also shock them. What with all these lethal cars, trains and planes just lurking about ready to murder people at any moment, it's all a matter of perspective and what we're used to. Anyway, my first encounter with a Vodianoi was when we hauled one onto the boat. Fishing it out of the water with a net and lots of effort, I was left to my own devices with the thing, free to get a good look at it close up before I got hacked into for the valuable parts and tossed back into the water again. Although it's a story for another time, we were also very busy on the lookout for a larrikin, which had gotten scent of my skill with spells and was now tailing after the boat. Though I never got a good look at it on that trip, I got to see one later. Not what I was expecting at all. A hackasha found in the old empires is a misty horror made of fangs and gore. Its cousin, the larrikin, is instead a big yellow blob with two yellow tentacles. No mores and such at all. And when you consider the Nishru came to Faerun, I think from the Orc Gates, from the massive battle realm of Nishrek, ruled by the Orc god Grumsh, it looks far more similar, but it's not as vicious as the Hakisha. It looks more like an evaporated cloud of clotted blood, which makes a lot of sense if you ever visit Nishrek and stop by a pond thinking you can drink it. It's rusty blood, a lake of rusty blood covered in fiendish insects. It's gross. Speaking of insects, the corpse of the Vodianoi soon gathered a big cloud of them. The thing is eight feet tall, but I was told that this is not as big as they get. Some get over ten feet tall had been witnessed. The thing was very bulky, just solid muscle and armor plates. So those huge projecting mandibles did look like a slime-covered, fishy, green and yellow-skinned giant insect thing. But then your brain sort of tricks you and you sort of make sense of it and suddenly it looks like some nightmare mating of a gorilla and a cockroach, or perhaps in the case of the Vodianoi, not a cockroach, but a giant prawn or something. It's neither of the two, yet it doesn't seem like a natural creature either, and there is good reason for that, because it's not. Though the true origin of the species may have been lost in time, speculation is rife, and the fact that they are found damn near everywhere and the Neogi travel with them, well, Maybe the Neogi bred them and from some other type of creature, but perhaps the Neogi just adopted the species after the Batraki amphibian creator race retired to the Outer Plains long ago. These monsters just scream Batraki at me. We shall go into more detail on the Vodianoi in a moment, but let's turn our attention to the more well-known and dare I say popular Umberhulk. These monstrous denizens of the Underdark and far, far beyond have been around for a very long time, ignoring 4th edition lore, as per usual. 
The rest of the law for the Upper Hulk pretty much lines up with them being created long ago by the Petraki as slave soldiers and the Neogi having essentially taken over custody of the species some time after, except the Neogi are not typically aquatic or amphibious. So they left the Vodianoi to their own devices, and thus Umber Hulks are far more common and exist in much greater variety, spread across who knows how many worlds, and certainly infesting the depths of Toril, both under land and sea. There is a study of the Umber Hulk, part of a text titled Creatures of the Earth's Deeps, written by the sage and wizard Archmiel, who says this, The Umber Hulk is one of the most powerful and dangerous underground denizens. Although only infrequently encountered, Umber Hulks have become well known because of their distinctive appearance and the ferocity of their attacks on adventurers. I've heard numerous stories of small bands of Umber Hulks destroying larger parties of experienced adventurers, leaving nothing but dropped weapons and debris behind. His illustrations of a sample creature are not as skilled as I would hope, but his depictions of it is great. He estimated that the Umber Hulk adult weighs from 1,500 to 1,750 pounds. They stand around 9 feet tall and 4.5 feet wide, with powerful arms that end in claws like iron, that are well suited for ripping apart rock and other creatures with ease. They are slow, thankfully, or at least they were. They have a speed of 30 feet per round in 5th edition and a natural burrowing speed of 20 feet per round, which is pretty fast for digging through dirt and rock. Captive, trained Umber Hulks often have their hands removed and replaced with heavy blades. This prevents them from burrowing away from captivity, but preserves their ability to create a doorway wherever the hell they like in anything less than a fortified building. Captives often have their smaller ape-like eyes removed, for good reason. Those eyes are capable of unleashing the monster's confusing gaze attack. When a creature starts its turn within 30 feet of the Umber Hulk and is able to see the Umber Hulk's eyes, the Umber Hulk can magically force it to make a DC 15 charisma saving throw unless the Umber Hulk is incapacitated. On a failed saving throw, the creature can't take reactions until the start of the next turn and rolls a D8 to determine what it does during that turn. On a 1 to 4, the creature does nothing. On a 5 or 6, the creature takes no action but uses all its movement to move in a random direction. On a 7 or 8, the creature makes one melee attack against a random creature or it does nothing if no creature is within easy reach. So that can be an ally. Unless surprised, a creature can avert its eyes to avoid the saving throw at the start of its turn. If a creature does so, it can't see the Umber Hulk until the start of its next turn when it can avert its eyes again. If the creature looks at the Umber Hulk during the meantime, it must immediately make a saving throw. In close combat, the Hulk will strike out with both of its claw hands and use those great big mandible blades almost like a boar uses its tusks. Both types of attack are plus 8 to hit and inflict slashing damage. The claws do 1d8 plus 5 damage and the mandibles do 2d8 plus 5 slashing damage. I did mention they can burrow through solid rock. Normally this is, reduces their speed to half as solid rock is basically difficult terrain for them. Also, while normally they move under the earth without leaving a tunnel behind them, in the case of solid rock, it does leave a tunnel around 5 feet wide and just over the height of the Umber Hulk who dug it. Despite having a mouth packed with teeth of a similar style to a great white shark, the mouth is not well suited to biting in combat, so they don't generally do it. Just the mandibles. The Umber Hulk's large insectoid eyes on the outside of its head, set wide apart on its squat head, are white with black irises, while those on its forehead are purple with yellow and amber irises. The creature lacks a nose but breathes through gill-like structures on its almost non-existent neck, which is a clear indication the Vod Yanoi seem to be the original stock which the Umber Hulks were bred from. Having gills in the neck like that, they can eat and breathe at the same time, which suits their gluttonous, rapid and revolting eating style of just tearing chunks uh, with those claws and stuffing bloody gore and offal into their maw as fast as possible. Umber Hulks are capable and willing to eat bits of you as they tear them off you, even in the middle of combat. Well, adapted to the life underground, Umber Hulks can survive a long time without water. They have a tremor sense out to 60 feet and dark vision out to 120 feet. Their passive perception is only 10 though. I should mention that the Vodianoid don't have the two sets of eyes. Instead, the damn things make use of schools of swirling electric eels to assist them in combat. These monsters usually prey on other subterranean creatures like ant eggs and small purple worms, which you'd think would be good, against which the Umber Hulks have developed their powerful offensive array. It's said that Umber Hulks allow themselves to be spotted alive by great purple worms for the thrill of tunneling out and slaying the worms from the inside out. There is a note that a habit picked up by the specific dead specimen examined by Archmail was to burrow up under a jail and to make a little lair for itself. Then it simply burrowed into each cell, locked cell, and ate the prisoner one after another. 
The area surrounding Labahulk's underground lair is crisscrossed with numerous tunnels, making it difficult for other creatures to find the lair itself. Some of the tunnels are safe dead ends, while others lead back to their points of origin in a very roundabout fashion. And all of the tunnels are well known to the Umberhulk, who which uses them to catch victims by outflanking them. While it's not impossible to hunt down a fleeing Umberhulk, it is difficult. They are quite likely to dig escape tunnels, which collapse behind them after a short while, potentially killing any pursuers with cave-ins, so be very wary. Thanks to those gills, an Umberhulk can still breathe water for up to 10 minutes at a time, so they have no problem flooding underground tunnels as well. I mentioned earlier that Umberhulk attacks leave a trail of destruction and debris. They tend to destroy anything they can't use. Any clothing found in the lair will be shredded, armor torn and dented, weapons broken and useless. And yet, despite this, for some reason, they can be halted in their tracks sometimes by a sufficient amount of precious metal treasure. I suspect this may have something to do with their mating habits. Only the sight of gold or platinum in very large amounts will halt their attacks once begun. Both male and female Umberhulks appear the same externally, equal in size and ferocity. However, female Umberhulks are much rarer than the male, with only one Umberhulk in four being a female. For this reason, the males are very protective of the females, often sacrificing their own lives in the female's defense. Little is known about how Umberhulks reproduce. The female bears her live young a year after mating, reproducing one to three hulklings. The young are quickly able to move about and defend themselves, developing all of their special powers with great rapidity. The mother is especially dangerous during this time as she will hunt down and kill as much food as possible to feed her ravenous young who eat voraciously. And after two years, the young Umberhulks will learn to hunt at their mother's side. Those that have survived this long are considered mature adults in every respect. After a few months more, the young leave and the mother may start another litter. Male Umberhulks live an average of 50 years, females 75 years. Umberhulks venture above ground only at night and only when desperate for prey as they seriously dislike very strong direct sunlight, suffering disadvantage on attack rolls and visual perception checks or saving throws involving sight in direct sunlight. Those found in the service of Niyogi or those forced to live and work above ground for years will have no penalties from sunlight, but they still prefer the shade or better yet to work in darkness. There are instances of Umberhulks working willingly with other evil creatures because despite their brute appearance, they do have brains. 5th edition D&D has stuck with the law that gives them quite a high intelligence of 9 so they can actually understand common. But in addition to their own language, which consists of various grunts, hisses and gestures for added emphasis involving the hands, mouth, mandible and eye movements, they may also learn to speak uh, on the common or various other languages, abyssal, things like that, though in the same way their language is simple enough but impossible for a human to duplicate exactly, the Umberhulk will find the common tongue quite difficult, managing only a buzzing or a clacking noise instead of the letters B, T, P and such, because their mouth is just not well suited for making those noises. Despite this aptitude, most folks think that Umberhulks and Vodianoi are not intelligent, and the creatures are smart enough to know that this is a big advantage, so they don't generally speak and sometimes do deliberately stupid seeming things, which are just misdirection played out so that prey can be flanked and attacked where they're not paying attention. This is not always the case. Like I said, there's a great variety and variation in this ancient species. So even if they have accepted some handsome payment for their services in the form of gold, platinum or human beings for them to eat, their mercurial and sometimes erratic nature often causes them to turn on their masters for no reason. There are rumors that you can find cities of nothing but umberhawks deep in the underdark, though city is a bit generous. It's more like a large conglomeration of lairs all clustered around a very favorable region. The lair of an Umberhulk is large, spacious caverns or rooms, the walls of which are always covered by marks from the Umberhulk honing its claws or possibly from having carved the cave from the stone itself. Attached to the large cavern are numerous smaller rooms for storage for what few items of treasure and food the Hulk has attained over the years. In deep freshwater lake beds or on the edge of great cliffs and continental shelves under the waves, Vodianoi burrow their lairs. All the rooms will be littered with the remains of previous victims bought here for leisurely consumption. The treasure cave is usually hidden by rocks and debris, which uh, there's some simple traps such as rock slides, pits, balancing boulders and trapped ravenous vermin and the like, snapping giant oysters, giant stargazers, moray eels and small schools of dangerous fish are common with the Vodianoi. The vast majority of wild umberhulks and even the Vodianoi are loners though. They see no point in living and hunting together as it just ends up wiping out all the food in the area faster. As I mentioned, the umberhulks is valuable all by itself. Its hide is extremely tough and popular with the monstrous races of the Underdark as a material to make armors and shields. 
They normally craft the stuff from corpses of Umberhulks they find, not ones they kill, as mostly they run away from the Umberhulks. The 8 inch long and super hard mandibles are also used as handheld weapons, and the claws are turned into spiked clubs and maces. The eyes from the forehead are often needed by magic users for potions and magical inks, and they can be sold for up to 400 gold coins each to alchemical shops or wizards guilds. Unfortunately, despite the beetle-like appearance, they don't lay eggs. They give birth to live and helpless young Hulklings. As I mentioned, they grow to one foot tall within three months, able to hunt already, with claws and mandibles already quite dangerous. And baby Uncle Hulkling has the strength to snap a human finger like a twig. Never forget these things can claw their way through stone. At one year old, if they've not been broken and trained, they will be wild and very dangerous. And when, uh, within another year, they will be fully grown. So... More evidence that this is an engineered species with an enormous growth rate like that. Along with the Neogi, the Elithids, also known as Mind Flayers, also kept mentally dominated Umberhulks for use as brute muscle. And there are more than a few spellcasters who select the Umberhulk as the perfect enthralled minion. I heard a rumour that you could find them in mansions in Halrua dressed in fine butler's attire, serving guests at lavish feasts. But sadly this turned out to be a load of bullshit. A subspecies called the Umber Ravagers, smaller and known to live closer to the surface, are sometimes captured by Grimlocks, and deep-dwelling Orcs and Orogs also capture them to use them as hunting beasts. Dragons rarely keep them around, though they are handy for making alterations to rocky lairs. It's always evil dragons, though. Good dragons never keep them around. One of the main reasons they don't really have any allies in the Underdark is because all their tunnel making and excavations often break into sealed off areas containing terrible dangers, or they accidentally construct passages linking factions who are at, soon at war with each other. Dwarves are well known for recognizing the tunnels of Umberhulks and will follow them, chasing the Umberhulk as they say. This expression also means to do something very dangerous in hopes of a big payoff with sufficient luck. Gary Gygax invented the first Umber Hulk, so they are one of the core monsters of the original D&D game that are entirely invented and have no relation to any mythological creature from folklore or old religions. He likely just based the monster on one of these two plastic toy figures. Remember those cities of Umberhulks I was talking about? The most stable and static populations of Umberhulks excavate these huge caverns stocked with fungus varieties that are eaten by lots of different insect species, and the Umberhulk will feed on the largest of the giant insects. It's in these populations where you find the truly horrid Umberhulks, that's their name, which have survived and thrived and now stand up to 16 feet tall and weigh up to 8,000 pounds. In the Outer Plains, about the most notable variety of the Umberhulk I've heard of is called the Abyssal Hulk. They have acid for blood that they can also spit at enemies. Their confusing gaze is enhanced, able to produce madness in some and charm others into attacking their own allies. The minions of the demon lord Yenogu once collected a massive mob of these creatures and forced them into service as guardians and watchers. These Abyssal Hulks lurked beneath the ground along well-travelled paths in the Abyss, waiting to rise up and attack. My name is AJ Pickett, professional YouTube RPG Sage, and I upload regular videos with hundreds archived and ready for you to binge watch like you are Neo learning Kung Fu. Thank you for listening, and as always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.